All right, well, hello everyone. <laughs> All right, so my name's Adele Costa. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the head of a school of mathematics and statistics here at UNSW, and it um, gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this event. We're really happy as a school to host an event such as this for one of our long-term members of school. Um, Trevor joined us in 2012, I believe, and in our Department of Applied Mathematics, and uh, it's been great having him as a wonderful contributing colleague in the school ever since. Um, and uh, this is part of uh, our program of events that allows all of the fabulous uh, research and things going on in the school to be uh, released to a wider audience. Uh, I really don't have a lot to say except welcome. I'm so pleased to have Trevor with us here tonight. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this event. And in doing so, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, the Bedigal people, and uh, their elders past and present. And pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. So without further ado, I'll uh, pass to Matt England, who will do a proper introduction of Trevor. Thanks, thanks Adele. Um, I echo Adele's welcome, and I want to thank the School of Maths, a school that I was part of um, some years ago, for running uh, tonight's event, acknowledging Susanna Waters, Sean Gardner, Ben, Jan, and Isabella for their contributions for setting the night up. Thanks so much. Uh, what a privilege to introduce young Trevor, Emeritus Professor Trevor McDougall. Um, I first had the privilege of meeting young Trevor uh, when, he was really, when he really was young Trevor, back in 1986, 1987. Still am. Still, he still is. I, I was a young whippersnapper myself. I was just a vacation scholar going down to CSIRO Marine Laboratories in uh, Hobart. And um, 86, 87 was the summer. And you know, I got down there, I worked with Gary Myers on El Nino heat content variations. Gary was a wonderful scientist and a, sad to have lost him a couple of years ago. But whilst I was there, the, the good people at CSRO took us on a tour of all the scientists, including John Church and George Creswell and Chris Vandry and Stuart Godfrey, who was my PhD advisor years later. But also young Trevor was there along the list. And, uh, Trevor started telling me about ocean thermodynamics. And I, I knew that the equation of state was nonlinear. But I had no idea you could make a whole career out of the nonlinearity of the equation of state. <laughs> Congratulations, Trevor. Um, Trevor's career by that stage was already well underway. He was only, if you do the maths, he was pretty young. Um, he'd already, uh, his papers, seminal papers on neutral surfaces, on ocean mixing, on thermobaricity and cabling, these are iconic processes that Trevor discovered very early in his career and, and wrote about. And those papers were coming out later that year in 1987. Um, really impressive for somebody at that age. Um, yeah, and, and so my interactions with Trevor back then as, a, as an honours student, then as a PhD student, were really illuminating. Trevor always took an interest in what I was trying to get done. Uh, we actually even dabbled in a bit of work for a while there on what became known as Gent McWilliams and then Gent Adele mixing scheme that Trevor was part of that paper. We were almost famous. We were almost famous. I've got the diagram somewhere in a filing cabinet that almost showed those GM overturning circulations. We didn't quite get the conservation of mass sorted, but anyway. Um, so I've had, it, Trevor's been hugely influential in my career. He's been a great mentor, a fabulous person to interact with and, and talk about ocean physics with. And he's also got that young boyish cheekiness that you want in, in a scientist, somebody who is out for discovery and, and knows the joys of curiosity and, and blue sky research, trying to understand stuff just because it's out there and you can work hard at it. And when you make a discovery, you probably find out down the track what it means and why it's important. And that's a, it's a wonderful uh, spirit of scientific discovery that I think Trevor embodies uh, very well. His CV is ridiculously long. And if I spent time going through some of Trevor's successes, I'd probably take over um, pretty much a half of his allotted time tonight. So I won't do that. But I want to highlight a couple of things that are uh, just fabulous on, on, his, um, on his track record as, as, as a scientist in Australia here. Uh, he, he was actually, actually elected Fellow of the Royal Society in 2012, and I believe the first Fellow of the Royal Society ever elected from UNSW. It's lucky Trevor arrived about a week or two earlier. 
to, to, to get that snuck into to our, um, our university's history. He's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. He was a CSIRO fellow elected in 2007. The AGU, the IUGG, there's a long list. There's eight different institutions he's a fellow of. Very importantly for tonight, um, he won the Prime Minister's Prize for Science in 2022, and part of tonight is a celebration of that incredible achievement. I mean, this is probably the top most prize awarded in Australia for science in any field of science, medical research, mathematics, psychology, all those, the list goes on. Um, Trevor's also a companion of the Order of Australia for eminent service to science. He's not just a scientist who does science, but he also looks out for uh, the community. He wrote a seminal report on climate and ocean science capacity a couple of years ago, reviewing where the gaps are, what needed to be done, right at a time when our field was under siege from federal um, and CSRO funding cutbacks. Um, he was awarded the uh, Prince Albert I Medal in 2011, the Centenary Medal in 2001, and again, a longer list than I have got the time to go through tonight. Um, I want to come fast forward, though. I can tell my mic use is not going very well. I'm sort of wavering in and out. I hope you can hear all the, all the text. Um, I want to fast forward, though, to the last couple of years. Um, when I say a couple of years, it, it, at my generation stage, that's the last 11 years, so, um, and that is, that is Trevor's time here at UNSW. I just want to um, acknowledge, especially Jason Middleton, Meninia Rowan, School of Mathematics, the DVC research at the time, uh, Les Field, who backed this guy, who, who saw him uh, leaving CSIRO, let's, let's say leaving CSIRO, um, at a time in his career when he had so much still to contribute. Uh, and this 11 years has been remarkable. He's influenced a whole other generation of early career scientists. He's done that all his career, but we've had the privilege of Trevor being here for the last 11 years, contributing to the culture of UNSW, especially in ocean physics, and bringing his wonderful vision for science to this community. So with that, I would like to invite young Trevor, Emeritus Professor Trevor McDougall, to the stage to give us a bit of a talk about what's going on with the ocean and what's got to do with climate change. Can you please welcome Trevor to the stage? Uh, thank you, uh, Adele and Matthews, for those undeserved words. Um, <clears throat> I want this to be the picture that you take away from tonight's uh, talk. This is a, um, a rendition of what scientists think uh, North America looked like 18,000 years ago. And uh, most of Canada is under two kilometres of ice. And even where Trump Tower stands today is under one kilometre of ice. That's the part I really like. Um, <laughs> and um, this is because it was the end of the, of the last ice age. Now, anyone has a guess of what the average temperature is around the planet during an ice age versus uh, like now? Uh, you, you know, so that's not a guess. Well, the answer is about five degrees Celsius. And most people think uh, their, their gut reaction says it's much more than that. It's only five degrees. And I want you to keep that in mind when we consider climate change. This is a, uh, a in detail, um, a figure of temperature as a function of time going back from, um, oops, I'll use the, going back from today in the past and uh, 20,000 years is here. Human civilization, that's when we started to use the land for agriculture and, and uh, animals for um, husbandry of animals. And we're kicking the planet with this, these lines here of purple and red in terms of the temperature. And the, the scale here, I mean, this is 2,000 years ago when Jesus was, was walking planet Earth was around here. And so we've had this warm period for, you might think, a long time, like 18,000 years. Uh, <clears throat> um, but how long is that really? Well, this is a longer, going back in time for even further, this is going back 400,000 years. And the carbon dioxide, which we're kicking upwards now, has gone through this pattern, and the temperature has gone through this pattern. So an ice age lasts for around 100,000 years and, and uh, then it gets a warm period for 20,000 years, etc. And sea level varies by 100 metres, plus and minus 100 metres in the same, same fashion. 
Now, 350,000 years, is that very long? Well, that's when Homo sapiens evolved around here, 350,000 years. So we've only been around on planet Earth as a species, as a cunning, warlike, intelligent, cunning, intelligent, cunning species uh, for three of these cycles. And I'm going to continue talking about the Ice Age. So what caused these Ice Ages? We weren't around to uh, upset the carbon dioxide balance of the planet. What caused it was very slight variations to the amount of sunlight reaching particularly the northern hemisphere. So the Earth um, rotates around and the axis on which it rotates isn't always fixed. It, ro it wobbles around with a 23,000 year period. And then the actual angle of the spin of the Earth also changes with a 41,000 year cycle. And then the Earth goes around the Sun not only in its ellipse, but also sometimes in a more circular pattern. And that's got a cycle of about 100,000 years. And you mix all these together, add them up, and you get a cycle which is about 100,000 years long that kicks this into, into play. And the actual variation, the actual variation in the heat coming from the heat flux coming from the sun that causes this is a minuscule amount of watts per square metre compared with how fast we're kicking the planet today. Okay. <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> now have another slide on this effect. You see there's two periods here which are in blue and of course the present red. And here we are, we're kicking the planet up with our fossil fuel burning. And that's, that's the last 2,000 years here in terms of carbon dioxide as a function of time. And going up since the Industrial Revolution, going up like this, about 100 parts per million or more. And this slide is meant to impress on you that the last time that the planet evolved out of an ice age into a warm period, the most recent time is here and the previous time is here. Those two times are shown here. And the point is that the natural cycle of the Earth in changing its climate go, it takes like 10,000 years to make up its mind and go somewhere. And yet we're giving this planet one almighty kick, uh, on almighty magnitude and a very fast kick at that. So I want to keep, you have keep in mind that the these glaciations happened uh, much slower than today uh, and uh, a planet that's in the middle of an ice age is only five degrees Celsius colder than today. The most recent record looks a bit like this from the last century or so and no matter where you do the research, whether you're in NOAA or in other places in Europe, um, even if you're actually uh, being funded by a climate uh, skeptic think tank, uh, one of those is here as well. You, the data is such that you can't get away from this curve. We're warming and it's really accelerating away from uh, the 60s like this. And the last couple of this year will almost certainly be another record uh, high here because we're coming out of th three El Ninos in a row. And there's the present record sh uh, showing up as a function of season as well, a month of the year across here. And the most recent nine years here are coloured and they're all near the top of this curve. And 2023 is emerging as the highest. Um, and this dashed line is the one and a half degrees Celsius above the uh, pre-industrial level. And the dotted curve is two degrees. And the anomaly is shown in the bottom graph here with 2023 really standing out. Now, I don't know why the 2023 is so much warmer than uh, the other years at this time of year. Uh, it's not just the coming El Nino, which is, uh, has its surface temperature signature in the equatorial Pacific, which is not such a large area. It seems to be something going on in the North Atlantic sea surface temperature. Matthew might be better informed about that. But that's the latest how the planet's going today. I want to talk a bit more about what we should be doing to address this climate emergency. And this is a figure from a few years ago, I think about 2011, 
where <clears throat> the story was, the narrative was, well, if we get serious about addressing this issue today and start decreasing our consumption per year of our burning of fossil fuels, we c we've got a two-thirds chance of not exceeding this two degrees warming target if we follow such an emissions curve as a function of time. But if we delay by nine years to 2020 before we address it seriously, then we have to uh, address it more, uh, more in a sharper fashion, reducing our emissions at 9% per year. Of course, we're not doing that. And this is a more updated figure where the, um, the data is here. It's what we have been burning as a function of time. This is what we are, our, our policies around the world have actually implemented policies that will take us along here if they keep on going. Where we need to be is down one of these curves. If we want to limit the warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, we need to be uh, coming at this rate. And of course, we're, we're actually, if anything, going along here. So in no sense are we avoiding uh, the problem. And this is what the future looks like if we decide to avoid, to address the problem properly, or if we don't, if we just have business as usual. This, this uh, heading refers to a, a certain emissions pathway of burning our fossil fuels. This is where you do a lot of work and you have carbon uh, taxes in place, that kind of thing. And this is where you do no work. And you can see uh, in this one century, from the turn of last century to the, the end of the present century, the warming is like an extra one and a half degrees Celsius here if we work hard. If we don't, we're looking at between five and 10 degrees Celsius on the planets. Uh, the amount of um, floods and famines there would be unimaginable. All right, so now that's, um, with the talk's heading is what's the ocean got to do with climate? So <clears throat> the planet as a whole is uh, warmed near the equatorial region by this incoming uh, solar radiation. And that's a surplus of extra heat coming uh, in the equatorial region. And there's also a, a deficit. In other words, the heat um, is lost near the poles. <clears throat> now, um, if, sorry, if it weren't for the fluid parts of the planet, the atmosphere and the ocean, then all this heating at the equator would just keep on making the equator so hot it would be uh, much hotter than it is today and the poles would be much, much cooler than today. And so the atmosphere and the ocean have a role to play uh, to redistribute this heat from the equatorial region towards the poles. And the ocean plays a, a part in that and of course the atmosphere plays a big part as well. So that's its first service it does for us. And the way it, the ocean distributes heat around the planet is twofold. First of all, a horizontal circulation. So that, for instance, we know the Gulf Stream here is warm and it comes back a bit colder as it does this circle around here. That warm water keeps uh, England a bit warmer than it would otherwise be, etc. And the other uh, way it does it is by vertical overturning circulation, which goes by the fancy name of the thermohaline circulation. Thermo meaning temperature and haline meaning salt. <coughs> and the remarkable thing about this is that the surface water in red only gets transformed into deep blue water here in two factories, two places. One is the Southern Ocean <coughs> and the other is the North Atlantic in the Labrador or the Arctic. And so the whole planet has chosen to have these two sites where it forms this bottom water. <clears throat> and half of the water in the world ocean has last seen the surface near Antarctica. This is the main factory of, of deep water. When we ideal, if we look at it in the split it up in terms of ocean basins, from the Indian to the Atlantic to the Pacific, the, the, the Unifying feature is this large current going around the Southern Ocean called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. It's a lot of water. It's, uh, if every person in China, man, woman and child, was drinking a stubby of beer every second, that's the volume of water we're talking about. Um, and uh, so it forms this bottom water. It sinks to the bottom and goes north 
and eventually returns. And I'll be talking about how this bottom water gets less, how it returns by becoming less dense later on. Another thing the ocean does for us is it melts ice. So the main region, the main way that um, this happens is water from the ocean comes under this floating ice shelf, melt, melts the ice, and the water coming out <coughs> is then fresher <coughs> and less dense. <coughs> now without ocean, without uh, climate change, this would be in steady state. You'd have atmospheric water vapour being thrown uh, poleward and coming down as snow, turning into ice, and that would slowly come out from <coughs> the left here, uh, flow like a slow flowing river of ice in this uh, ice shelf. <clears throat> With climate change, the ocean's warmer. It melts more under this um, ice shelf, I think, Sunil. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, more of this ice is melting. So that 100 metres or so of um, vari variation in sea level during uh, ice ages, the melting process is this. It's the, it's the ocean under mining these floating ice shelves, mostly in Antarctica. Now, <clears throat> since about the mid-90s, we've um, known that this is a real issue, and people that design satellites have designed them differently so that they will go in a, uh, a trajectory, an orbit, which takes them far enough south to see the Antarctica. Beforehand, they turned around at lower latitudes. And so we'd be getting this information about how high the ice is in Antarctica, and you see it's, um, the loss is just growing. Uh, and even though the Industrial Revolution happened way up here somewhere on the graph, you can see that this growth is still accelerating quite sharply. In the Arctic, uh, the volume of ice is also uh, decreasing rather dramatically. Uh, this schematic shows it, the volume in terms of the size of this cube of ice, but also the graph behind it. And this, this volume takes into account not just the area of ice, but also the thickness. And um, so in the, in the Arctic, there's very little ice that's more than one year old. There used to be multi-year ice, three or four year old, uh, ice, more of it. And this is taken from a paper of Matthews, uh, published a little while ago few months ago. And so this melting of the ice here is happening, making this water less dense. And that means that the water that's flowing over here and filling up the bottom of the ocean is less dense, which gives the mixing processes here something to work on. And we're finding less dense water at the bottom of the ocean. So even at the bottom of the ocean, when we go measure it, it stands out like anything, that even down there at four kilometres depth, things are changing. We're a very clever species. Human beings, if you put them all in a cube with no air, like sardines, the cube is only one kilometre on a side. And yet we're that clever, we can change the whole planet, and we have. Okay, so here is perhaps the biggest service that the ocean does for you and me. It actually absorbs most of the heat that the planet has received from climate change. Um, concentrate on the, on the uh, purple bars. This, is, this one here is the total um, extra heat that the oceans, that the planet has received from 1961 to about the 40-year period. And some of it's gone into mate, to melting Arctic ice, some to heating up the atmosphere, some to heating up the ground on which we walk, perhaps the top metre of it. Some, that's the continent, some for melting Antarctic ice, some melting Greenland ice, some glaciers. But the bulk of it, 90% of it, is simply <coughs> being spent in warming up the oceans. So imagine what plight we'd be in today if the ocean were a metre thick or even 100 metres thick. We'd be much warmer than we are. Okay, so this is a, a graph through time of that heat content. So the previous graphs I showed about temperature were all the temperature at the sea surface. But we oceanographers think mostly in terms of the, the um, 
total amount of heat in the ocean, no matter what depth it is, surface or deeper. And this is the heat content down to 2,000 metres, and you can see it's just monotonically going up. <coughs> and the most recent data from which we've gained this information has come from these Argo floats, which are floats that uh, we, th we deploy from from ships, doesn't have to be a research vessel, could be a merchant ship. And when I say we, I mean the community, not me in particular. Um, and it's, a, it, uh, it's designed to, uh, to float around the ocean freely. It's not, not tied to the bottom. And it operates like this. <clears throat> it sinks to a thousand meters depth and stays there for a month, just asleep. And then after a month, its little clock says it's time to wake up. It sinks to 2,000 metres and then turns around and comes, and comes up all the way to the surface measuring for those 2,000 metres. Sends the information to the satellite. Satellite says, I've received the information. It sinks and goes to sleep for a month. So we have this continual cycle of um, these robots uh, measuring the ocean for us. And two, in October, two years ago, this was, there were almost 4,000 floats out there doing this, distributed in that fashion. These are wonderful things because in, <clears throat> before Argo, we, we had very few ships in the Southern Ocean, and they were mostly there in summertime, not wintertime, for obvious reasons. Um, and now, every year, this, these Argo floats uh, deliver more data in that one year than we have had in the previous century from ships. So it's, it's a, great, a great device. Um, so now I've been asked to say a bit about climate and a bit about my work. And so um, here's, uh, here's Rabina and Richard, um, and, and here's me. Um, and uh, I hope that my, my answer to this question will be uh, almost as comprehensible as this. <laughs> all right, so I want to talk first of all about the very first piece of research I did as a graduate student at the University of Cambridge. Turned out that um, we had the two graduate students that shared, or three that shared the office. Um, one was Australian, and the office next door was occupied by Stephen Hawking, so that was a bit of an inspira inspiration. My supervisor said, go away, Trevor, and figure out what happens when an oil well blows out at the bottom of the ocean. And so an oil well has oil coming out, but it has gas as well. And the gas is a great source of buoyancy and drives this plume going upwards. How do I go backwards? There we go. Um, but uh, I quickly realised that uh, the bubbles will keep on going all the way to the surface, but the oil won't because what happens is that this, the plume entrains uh, seawater from this depth, which is dense, and <clears throat> it gets, soon gets to a point where, where the density of this water is equal to that of the ocean at, at this height. And then the, um, the plume, including most of the oil, comes out here, and the bubbles keep going. <clears throat> and uh, indeed, in the 2010, uh, 13 years ago, the deep horizon oil well blowouts in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, after a few months, they realised, oh, perhaps not, we haven't got all the oil. Perhaps it's got spreading out halfway. And in fact, half of the oil did in fact spread out at mid-depth and didn't reach the surface uh, to, <coughs> to be captured in the photographs of how it affected animals. And Matthew, there's no truth to the rumour that I actually caused the oil well blow out just to get citations for my paper. <laughs> All right, so uh, the ocean's layered. That means that the, the bottom of the ocean is, is denser than the top. <clears throat> and uh, we can look at this, this picture. There's a lot, of, a lot of scientific stories here. But I want to just talk about these layers this, this is uh, coloured with neutral density, um, some software we developed. And <clears throat> it's like having a party drink with all these different densities. Uh, I've, I've coloured it here in, in coloured alcohol. Um, 
And, uh, but you've got a very, it's very hard to mix it. Imagine mixing that with, say, a needle or something. Uh, very hard to stir it up. Uh, and yet we know that stirring up it must because we need to get this dense bottom water up to the surface again on time scales of like a thousand years. <clears throat> so let me quantify that. This is an experiment that a guy called Jim Lebwell did some years ago. It's been repeated many times, where he put out some dye at a particular depth in the ocean. Just it was he managed to put it out over a depth range of only a meter or so, and came back a year later, and it had spread out by like 30 meters plus and minus 30 meters over one year. So that's how, how slow things mix in the vertical. You put some dye out there, it spreads only 30 metres in the vertical. This was done at a depth of 300 metres. In the same time, that dye patch has moved around half an ocean basin, say 3,000 kilometres, 3 by 10 to the 6, 3 million metres. 3 million metres this way and only 30 metres this way. So <clears throat> our ocean is very layered. It's very hard to get things to move uh, vertically across these surfaces of constant uh, density. But therein lies a bit of a paradox. What do I mean by density? Uh, <clears throat> and um, so for um, more than a century we used this thing called potential density. Um, and uh, that was invented back in 1907. Um, and uh, so I'll put my head around that. What do we really mean by these surfaces of constant density? And the answer is uh, for three surfaces that coincide here, we had the one that was old fashioned and new stuff and the one in between was a different, a previous person's attempt. <coughs> okay, so the neutral uh, density surface is uh, is defined by these tangent planes. And a plane is such that you, you can get a parcel from here and move at a small distance in this plane without it then feeling that it wants to go up or down. It's happy staying there. It doesn't feel a restoring force. And mathematically that means that uh, we can find a three-dimensional gradient of temperature around us like this and salt. This is a particular type of salinity called absolute salinity. And this combination is the effect of those gradients on density. So um, the alpha here transfers the gradient of temperature into a, the contribution to the gradient of density and so forth, the salt. And the real fly in the ointment here is the fact that, <clears throat> that these coefficients, alpha and beta, depend not only on salinity and temperature, but also on pressure, a third variable. <clears throat> And so um, we actually know at each point in space, if we have data, we know what these gradients of temperature and salinity are, and we can work out what this vector is. And I'd put it to you this way, rather than worrying about the slide with some maths on it, you have a, a soup bowl. If I give you a soup bowl, every point on that bowl, you can say, what is the, the um, direction perpendicular to the bowl? you can tell me what that is. Just, it's a line that's perpendicular to the bowl. Um, but we have the op opposite problem. We have knowledge of that direction, the perpendicular direction everywhere. And the question is, does it describe a surface? Does it make a bowl? Knowing all the, the perpendicular directions, does it make a bowl? And the answer is it doesn't. Because in order to make a bowl, you need a sp very special relationship for this vector <clears throat> and when you reduce it down to what you need for the gradients of temperature, salinity and pressure, it's this. <clears throat> and that uh, is like, you know, you need to have perhaps second year mathematics to understand what that means, but here it is in a picture. So I'm in the ocean, I've got temperature, I know temperature and salinity and pressure all around me, and I go and draw a, a plane of constant temperature, it's a green plane here, and this one's a pink one, that's constant salinity. And the line in which they intersect is this vector. 
a line of constant salinity and temperature. Oops. And what this requirement says is that you'll only be able to form a soup bowl, a well-defined surface, from that knowledge if this line of constant salt and temperature happens to be horizontal, happens to be lying in the plane of constant pressure, this, this blue plane. And there's no reason for the ocean to oblige and do that, and it doesn't. It has a good go at it, actually, but it doesn't quite, can quite achieve that. And <clears throat> so there are these plat blotches or patches where, where these, the, uh, the soup bowl doesn't exist. There's a, a leak in it. And so the neutral direction is this red sort of arrow, and it's going through any soup bowl you pick, any surface you decide, any real well-defined surface you decide to pick, it'll find a wormhole through it. And here the wormhole's coming, the worm's going up, and here it's going down in blue. Uh, <clears throat> so Aaron uh, Lang has just completed his PhD uh, a few weeks ago and uh, has a, a, an advancement on this where we can actually get these, these red and blue patches down by a factor of three or four, but they still exist. And so it's something, it's a complication that we're now aware of um, since about 1990, I guess, where, where we have to put up with that and uh, feed that into everything we do in oceanography, in particular inverse studies. All right, so that's <coughs> one thing that young Trevor did. Um, and here's another. So this gets on to the, therm the thermodynamics. So again, in about uh, the year 1907, someone had a a good idea and that was to get rid of in situ temperature in the ocean and replace it with potential temperature. This temperature is independent of pressure. So when you, go, when you leave uh, sea level and drive up to the top of a mountain, it's colder. And the reason it's colder is because the pressure is less. Put another way, if you grab a parcel of air from the top of a mountain, put it in a plastic bag, drive down to sea level, the pressure will, will compress that, that, um, that, that parcel of air and warm it up. But it's only warming up the in situ temperature that you can measure with a thermometer. It's not the kind of thing you really want to know about when you're understanding how, uh, how um, density works in the atmosphere or how the, the dynamics work. How, how things are pushed around by these properties. All right, so the concept of potential temperature is you, you're at some depth in the ocean, you mentally put an insulating impervious bag uh, around this parcel and take it to a fixed pressure. And there you calculate or you measure the temperature and it becomes potential temperature. And that served our field well, our field well for a hundred years. Um, but we have, we kind of uh, used it too much and we assumed in our uh, ocean models that, um, that the temp this potential temperature also was proportional to the heat content of a seawater parcel. <clears throat> and this is where that comes unstuck because this is the heat capacity uh, at constant pressure. So here's numbers like 4,000 and here's numbers like 4,200. So if you get a, a kilogram of seawater and you want to warm it up by one degree Celsius, then here, this salinity, you must supply 4,000 joules. If you want to do it in a, in a second, you've got to apply, supply four kilowatts. Whereas down here, you've got to supply 5% more than that, if it's fresh. And so this was ignored for uh, a century, and I was uh, on sabbatical at Woods Hole, worrying about how perhaps we could improve on this, when on the 1st of July 1994, I was swimming before work and thought, what about we use the same idea of this plastic bag business, moving the parcel to the sea surface, but instead of asking what the temperature is when we get there, we ask what the enthalpy is. Enthalpy is like heat content. Um, this, is, this at face value seems a dumb thing to do because enthalpy is a very strong function of pressure. Um, 
and so, but by going for this potential concept, uh, I thought we'll give it a go. And it turns out, like by morning tea time, I figured out this was a really good idea. It took me another nine years to write it up in a way that convinced other people. Um, but uh, that was where the idea came from. Um, and this is the difference that between the old temperature, potential temperature, and the new, which is proportional to this potential enthalpy. Uh, and you see that if, you're, if the ocean is receiving fresh water, zero salinity at, uh, say, 30 degrees Celsius, from the Amazon, then it's actually receiving an amount of heat which is 1.5 degrees difference, different to what the previous practice was, uh, was assuming. So <clears throat> a simple theoretical idea turned out well, uh, gained an extra factor of 100 in accuracy and didn't cost anyone uh, anything actually in terms of computer time or, or, or anything else, just a case of being uh, attention to detail. And then we had that um, uh, adopted by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, part of UNESCO, after it was blessed by the scientific bodies, IAPSO and SCORE. All right, back to the um, upwelling of uh, bottom water. So here we remember we had this bottom water being formed in this Southern Ocean factory, very dense, sinking, and according to the most recent work, of course, we know that this rate of sinking is getting less. Um, but um, I want to address the question, how does this water come up? And it turns out a very influential paper by Walter Monk, an oceanographer who remained active until he was 102 years old, dying two years ago, um, said that this happens by having a constant vertical diffusion coefficient an exponential density profile and upwelling through the interior. Um, <clears throat> but then that, that had to be reconciled with this observation from like 30 years ago that mixing in the ocean, the deep ocean, is very much intensified towards the bottom. And you can understand why, because you have some, some rough topography here and you have the tide swishing this stratified fluid over this rough topography. I'm talking mountain ranges and seamounts. Um, this causes waves to, to uh, go up in the, in the fluid and break. And they break preferentially near, near where the topography is. So how can we reconcile this idea of where, how, getting the water up with uh, this bottom intensification and the mixing, which is, as I said, a recently realized thing. Um, and this is work I've done during uh, my middle part of my 11 years here, um, realising that there's uh, this bottom intensification in the mixing. There's almost no vertical mixing out here, stronger towards the bottom. That means, in fact, there's sinking through here. So contrary to the regular upwelling everywhere, um, everywhere apart from the very bottom boundary layer is sinking. Um, so it's quite a change in our view of the bottom half of the ocean. And because that's sinking, there actually has to be an even greater upwelling in the bottom uh, 150 metres. It's al almost a depth range where it's very hard to observe. Um, and so uh, we do believe that that's what's happening, that if you take a density range here in this model with uh, a sloping bottom, a, a, a curved bottom. The mean uh, upwelling is this black line. That's what we've always thought was going up everywhere uniformly. No, it's actually sinking throughout the bulk of the ocean and going up very fast just in these slimy, slippery, 100 metre thick, thin boundary layers. So it's quite a different view of how um, that part of the circulation is working. Um, Second last topic I'd like to talk about is uh, an interpolation method, which sounds uh, kind of dry, but it has a very applied outcome. So <clears throat> this is a, 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 some data from the ocean, um, and it's uh, salinity and temperature. And uh, we've used a spline and linear and a pea chip, which is a piecewise cubic hermite interpolating 
polynomial. It's, it's similar to a slime, but different. Um, and our own method that we've cooked up. And uh, you can see if I zoom in here, bottle number nine, the spline tends to have a bit too much structure. The spline's all about minimising curvature, doesn't care about how far, how far it's displaced so much. So we didn't, people um, have, uh, people don't use uh, the splines for this reason. Um, and uh, a cooked up example, if you like, of a, of a, a, a sharp uh, function, we call it the delta function. And a spline has these kinks here, this uh, ringing uh, away from the, where the action is. The action is here with the, da with the data points. Uh, the spline uh, has this ringing further away. Undesirable. Um, and so, and the, uh, another undesirable feature is that the P chip, when you have two points that are uh, describing a maximum or a minimum, is dead flat between them. And that doesn't seem realistic. Um, <clears throat> so what uh, we did was, uh, with Paul Barker, is that we, to avoid this feature where it goes dead flat if these two values are the same, we thought, well, what about we take this, this figure and rotate it? So instead of doing the P chip with these as axes, we do it with these as axes. So we just sort of look at the data on an angle. And in fact, we do that eight times. So we're doing 16 different P chips. And that works out a treat. Uh, <coughs> except when uh, the oceanographic data is separated by vastly different rates in the vertical. Maybe there's every 20 metres is data in the vertical here, and then all of a sudden, hundreds or if not thousands of metres between a bottle, you get information here and information here. And this is typical of what we had in the 1960s and 70s, where the only information came from lowering some actual physical bottles of about this size um, on, on a wire over a ship. You'd, you'd screw it onto the wire, lower it down, screw another one on. Um, I'm almost old enough to remember that. Um, and uh, so very, in, very infrequent data, not sort of numbers every centimetre. But we found a solution to that too, and that was to, um, oh, was to do, the, do this, uh, uh, this beach chip business with bottle number. In other words, uh, with even spacing between the information. All right, the point is that we developed a new interpolation method which works really well. And for oceanographers, we do a lot of our thinking on this temperature salinity diagram. And our method is the red one, much better than the splines, and much better than linear, which is the pink one here, which is what we're trying to do better than. All right. So why is all that important? Um, so I mentioned in the 60s and 70s, when we started getting ships going to sea and taking data, that the, the, the data was very infrequent in the vertical. You might have a information a temperature here and one down here and one here and when you because you can't use splines that are unreliable you tend people have tended to use just linear interpolation straight lines between bottles and you can see that overestimates the temperature in between information so that overestimates the amount of heat in the ocean in those that period now it doesn't matter in the present period because our data comes from those Argo floats which measures every few metres in the vertical. It's very, very frequent. But back in the 60s, the data was hundreds of metres apart. So linear interpolation gave us this number of, this amount of heat content, uh, at, whereas our present method is the black one. And uh, these are different by 14%. And so that <coughs> this was published just uh, last year. Or uh, well, the method was last year, and this was published in January. Um, so I think the world's still coming to terms with the fact that we actually have underestimated the actual warming of the planet simply because we haven't interpolated properly in the vertical. And my last uh, trick uh, to talk about is also in the last few years, and it, um, it's got a, a sort of a ringing back to that, uh, that uh, professor in Cambridge called um, Stephen Hawking because Newton held the very same chair of mathematics uh, in the same school of mathematics in the same university in Cambridge 
as uh, did Stephen Hawking, but Newton, of course, held the second, he was the second holder of that chair, the Lucasian chair. Um, and he's the guy that invented calculus, right? So you give him a function and he knows how to, how to, uh, how to estimate the slope. And he invented this method called Newton's method, which if, when you want to find uh, what value of x satisfies the function of x equal to zero, here's the, in black is the function of x, here's x, here's the function up here. You evaluate the function and its derivative here, the, der that's, the slope is the derivative is that blue line. You plug it in here and you go from the first guess of x here, this information, you get the second guess of x which is here. And you do it again, you calculate the slope in red and the value and you keep on doing this. And it's a really, really good method of finding um, the root. But I look at this and thought, well, why throw away this information when you're here? There's a lot of information between this, this data point and its derivative as well as this one. There's four bits of information there. Let's use the previous two. Um, and it turns out um, that's a good thing to do. So <clears throat> uh, Newton's method, if the error is like at one iteration is like 0.1, say, then the error at the next iteration is 0.1 squared. So it's 0.01, it's a hundredth. The next one, it's that squared, so it's 10 to the minus 4. Whereas this new method, the power is actually bigger than 2. This is 1.7 plus 1, 2.7. So whatever error was here is now raised to the 2.7th power. So it converges faster. And um, for an example, this function here, is a, these are nine different functions, and these are several, this is a whole range of input um, variables, input values to the function. And our method is this one, the second from the top. The average number of calculations of the function or its derivative is 12, whereas <coughs> Isaac Newton's was 19. And worse than that, there are spots here where it just doesn't converge, whereas ours converges over a bigger range. So, um, yeah, it's just a, a it's not oceanographic, it's not climatic, it's just fun mathematics. <laughs> I shouldn't be sorry about it, that's right. All right, so the summary, I've, I've talked about the Ice Age uh, problem as a calibration for your thoughts about climate change. Five degrees Celsius between the warmest and the coldest periods in an Ice Age. Humans, Homo sapiens, have only lived through three and a half Ice Ages. Um, and uh, we are way beyond time to address this issue seriously. I talked about how the ocean stores 90% of the extra heat the planet's received. Um, it's doing a great job for us. It's also getting more acidic and things I haven't talked about. Uh, this heat expands the ocean, makes it rise. I haven't talked too much about sea level rise. John Church would be the guy for that. Um, and oceanography is a young science and it's been really fun to work in a field where there are some quite fundamental things to discover. And I didn't have any right to expect this field was going to be such an exciting field. Because when I graduated with a PhD, uh, climate change wasn't on the agenda, wasn't talked about. Worse than that, even El Nino had not been discovered. Um, and so in that sense, you know, science develops quickly. This one person's short career, these things have, have occurred. Um, so if you're out there and considering a career in oceanography, I'm sure this university can help. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trevor, for this wonderful presentation and, and looking at all of, uh, well, all of the ways the ocean affect our, well, actually a sample of the ways the ocean affect our climate system and some of your amazing contributions to the field.